I'm going to talk to you about a, a study we did uh, at a New Mexico dairy in 2009. Uh, my co-authors at our ARS lab in Bushland, uh, Andy Cole, uh, and also uh, Robert Hagevort, uh, the dairy extension specialist in Clovis, New Mexico, and Ken Casey and Brent Auberman, my colleagues at Texas A&M and Amarillo. So we, we know about the environmental impacts of fugitive ammonia. But increasingly, we are seeing that there are regulatory pressures that the dairy industry is coming under. Uh, there was the consent agreement that resulted in the name study uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, in 2009, dairies were required to start reporting their, an estimate of their ammonia emissions. And just recently, uh, the EPA has been been sued to to move on ammonia regulation, and this will, this could potentially have impacts on on uh, animal production. Uh, the in the southern high plains, the uh, dairy industry has traditionally been centered in eastern New Mexico, the three counties of eastern New Mexico. But since 2000. In West Texas, the dairy cow population has grown from about 5,000 animals to uh, over 200,000 animals. And previous to the work we had done, uh, there had not been much research on um, um, th these uh, dairies in West Texas. Our objectives were simple. We wanted to quantify ammonia emissions at this dairy and we identified the major sources of ammonia emissions as being the open lot and the lagoon system and we also wanted to build a nitrogen balance for the dairy and identify stores and flows uh, where nitrogen was was being stored and and how it was moving between those stores the dairy is very typical of, of uh, eastern New Mexico, uh, comprised of a uh, open lot corrals. In this dairy, uh, 22 and a half hectares. Uh, and there's also a lagoon system that, that receives the wastewater from the open lots. This this dairy had about 3,500 cows. There were no calves present. This was entirely the pr production herd. 80% uh, of the cows on site were lactating, and they consumed 90% of the nitrogen that was fed. Uh, that feed averaged 16.7% uh, crude protein, and the cattle were producing 29 kilograms of milk per head per day. We quantified emissions using uh, in the inverse dispersion analysis. Uh, we use the software package called WinTrax. Uh, it requires three things to quantify ammonia emissions. You have to have a measure of ammonia concentration, which we measured with uh, open path lasers. You have to characterize the turbulence regime of the site. We used uh, three axis sonic anemometers located at the open lot and at the lagoons. And you also have to accurately map the source area of ammonia uh, to use in the uh, inverse dispersion analysis. We partition nitrogen at the dairy uh, with a combination of measurements and uh, estimates, uh, we measured uh, nitrogen intake and milk and the dairy provided us those data. And then we also measured the uh, ammonia loss. Uh, for nitrogen that was retained in cows, uh, another estimate of, of milk and, 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 and excretion, 
we use the uh, functions of Castillo et al. These are functions uh, of dry matter intake. Uh, that paper was a meta-analysis of some almost 600 cows with 91 different diets and it came up with a series of equations. So here's some of the features of the dairy. Uh, you can see the milking parlor. Each one of the corrals had a sunshade in it. Uh, there were two feed alleys, and on either side of those feed alleys, there were flush lanes. Those flush lanes uh, were flushed from the top. The water flowed down to a canal uh, that flowed 700 meters to the lagoon system. There was a solid separator at the lagoon system that separated and stockpiled solids uh, to the east of the lagoons. At the dry lot, we uh, deployed two of the open path lasers. The north one open path laser was stationary. It stayed there for the entire length of the study. Uh, the uh, second open path laser was opportunistically deployed. So our idea was that if the wind shifted, we would, we would take that second laser and move it to where it was downwind from the open lot. So it was either deployed on the east side or the west side of the open lot corrals, depending on the wind direction. We had one sonic anemometer at the lagoon system, and during the first four days of the study, that laser was uh, shot along the north side of the lagoons. And then uh, beginning on day 224, that laser shot diagonally from northeast to southwest across the lagoon system. This had some implications for our results, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Just kind of give you an idea of, of what the uh, New Mexico uh, Southern High Plains dairies look like. Uh, you can see the sunshade. You can see cattle loafing underneath the sunshade. Uh, the feed alley where the uh, feed is deposited and the cattle eat through stanchions and then the, uh, the uh, flush lane Uh, the open lot surface was managed fairly intensively. They are always running a harrow uh, or mounding up uh, manure, uh, fluffing up manure so it'll dry out and provide a, 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 a more amenable bed for the cattle. The flush system was supposed to flush twice a day, but in practice, it was very intermittent. Uh, sometimes uh, the dairy personnel would get to it and they would open the gates and they would flush and other times they just didn't get to it. Um, this particular day, they, they were able to get it opened up. So it wasn't a very regular, regularly scheduled uh, operation. And this is the solid separator to the east of the lagoons. And you can see the stockpile of solids. And then the, uh, the water would flow to, your, to the right into the first lagoon. And this is the first lagoon right here. And on the far right, you can barely see the second lagoon. And in the mid distance, you can see the third lagoon. That third lagoon was designed strictly as an overflow structure. So most of the water would go into these first two lagoons and then when they filled they would overflow into the third lagoon. This is the North One open path lasers 3.4 meters high shot along the uh, north fence line downwind of the uh, corrals and the to the right the uh, three axis sonic anemometer and the and some other subsidiary measurements that we took. Uh, the, the, these are the lasers that were deployed at the lagoon. There are, there are two lasers here because one's measuring methane and one's measuring ammonia. Uh, 
And then we also had the, a similar uh, uh, Met Tower with the sonic ammo on our setup on the, on the north side of the lagoon. This is um, ammonia flux from the from the open lot, and uh, you can see it, 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 it's quite variable. Uh, it did somewhat follow a diel cycle. Uh, we'll get to some more detail on that later. These are 15-minute uh, flux densities. And this is the flux density at the lagoons. Th th this, this is going to take a little bit of explanation because this was a very surprising result. Uh, during those first four days, the pattern of emissions was very much what we would expect, where ammo uh, ammonia emissions peak during midday and they have a min minimum at, at night. But those last four days, ammonia emissions were very much suppressed, and there was a reason for that. Right here, we had a big thunderstorm and received 29 millimeters of rain. That uh, large amount of rain that fell very fast and very hard uh, flushed a tremendous amount of water into the lagoon system. It overwhelmed that system. It, it, overflowed that berm into the third lagoon, uh, totally shut down the solid separator and, and the uh, recycling system. And it just so happened that, that we also changed the position of the laser. So now instead of being shooting along the, the north side of the lagoons, we were going uh, across the lagoons and it changed the footprint that was affecting that laser concentration measurement. So now we're getting more influence from that third lagoon. And what we learned the following year was that the emissions from that third lagoon are much less than the emissions from those first two lagoons. So those factors, uh, uh, dilution of the water, uh, and then moving that laser so that we changed the footprint resulted in this dramatic decrease in emissions from the lagoons. So this is a 24-hour composite of emissions. Uh, normally what we would expect to see would be a single peak. That's what we see consistently in, in beef cattle feed yards and what others have shown in dairies. But what we have here is kind of a, bi, a, a bimodal peak. And we, we believe that that is related to the milking schedule and when cows were moved to and from the milking parlor and how that influenced the footprint that was affecting our measurements. And here, this is at the lagoons. You can see that before the rain, we have a very typical uh, daily pattern of emissions that peak in midday and then the much suppressed emissions uh, after the rain. Overall, 95% of the emissions that we measured came from the open lot. So the lagoons contributed very, very little to the ammonia loss at this dairy. Uh, a total of 321 grams per cow per day were lost as ammonia, and that was about 43% of the nitrogen intake at this dairy. But we have to add some caveats here. This was conducted in August, so we would expect that this would be near the peak of the annual ammonia emissions. So we would expect to see high emissions uh, during this study period. And as is typical of dairies uh, in the Southern High Plains, this was the production, or these were all adult cows. There were no calves present, so these were large, uh, mostly lactating animals. <clears throat> 
And finally, most of the most of the manure was deposited on the open lot. There was some flushing that carried some of the manure to the lagoon system, but most of the manure was deposited on the open lot where it was uh, readily available for uh, volatilization. So our numbers that we saw will come in at the top end of the range of some of the uh, uh, emissions reported in the literature. Uh, what interesting, I, I'd, call, I'd, I'd call Dr. Latham when, when, when my number almost matched hers from her, her study in 2013. Um, one interesting point here is at, in her study, which is a, a kind of a hybrid open lot and free stall uh, housing situation, uh, about two thirds of, of that ammonia emissions came from the lagoon system and only one third came from the housing whereas in, in New Mexico 95% came from the open lot and only 5% from the lagoons. Another interesting thing to note here is that it really makes a difference how intensively manure is managed. So we're, in dairies where manure is intensively managed, uh, say uh, in freestall free barns where, where they're flush or scraped regularly, they tend to have uh, uh, lower emissions. But in the open lots that we studied, uh, they tended to behave more like beef cattle feed yards. Most of the manure was deposited on the surface and most of it was most of it was, most of the nitrogen was volatilized and lost as ammonia. We conducted a, a nitrogen balance of the dairy. Uh, and again, this is a combination of measured values and estimates using the equations of Castillo et al. Uh, Forty-three percent of the Nitrogen was lost as ammonia. 19% uh, went out as milk. Uh, about 2% was retained as cow gain, and 36% was attributed to the manure and lagoons. So, just to kind of give a, a, an idea of how nitrogen flows through this New Mexico dairy, uh, the values in black will be. Uh, either measured uh, or calculated. Uh, the values in red will be from Castillo's equations and uh, the magenta values are residual values. So at this day, we, the cattle were consuming on average 612 grams of nitrogen per cow per day. About 12 grams per cow per day was retained uh, in animals and about 120 went out in milk. Uh, somewhere between 450 and 500 grams of nitrogen were excreted, and 264 grams of ammonia nitrogen were lost to the atmosphere. And about 200 to 220 were retained uh, in manure or in the lagoons. I wanted to get an idea of, because these, this dairy seemed to be behaving more like a beef cattle feed yard, I thought, well, we, maybe we can get an estimate of annual emissions. Uh, this is kind of a, this is kind of a stretch because you're using nine days of data to estimate uh, an annual emission, but uh, I think it'll give you a, a, a sense of how different uh, these open lot dairies on the southern high plains are. Uh, Saqib Mukhtar had found that about 53 that winter emissions are about 53 percent of summer emissions uh, in East Texas. We had found in our beef cattle feed yards that. 15, that winter emissions were 59% of, of summer emissions. Uh, I chose to use this figure because the 
the open lots, uh, uh, open lot dairies seem to be behaving more like a fee, uh, feed yard in West Texas. So when we use that figure and looking at a range of uh, nitrogen intake from 600 or 700 grams of N per cow per day, we find that in winter, probably about a fourth of the fed nitrogen would be lost as ammonia and annually about a third of the fed nitrogen would be lost as ammonia. And th th this number is higher than we see in the literature for the more, for the uh, production systems that have more intensively managed manure. Well, we had high emissions during this study, about 321 grams per cow per day of ammonia, which represented 43% of the fed nitrogen. And what this seemed to show was that manure management is really critical. We had 95% of our ammonia emissions from the open lot, but where manure is excreted and how it's handled really critically determines how much ammonia is going to be lost and where nitrogen ends up in a dairy. I'll be glad to take some questions. Someone's got to challenge that annual emission estimate, right? <laughs> oh, okay. question was, uh, what is the role of diet in, in, in reducing ammonia emissions? Uh, it's very important. I'm going I'm to address this to beef cattle because I, I'm more familiar with beef cattle than I am with dairy cows. What we find is that when, when you exceed that optimum diet as far as nitrogen, uh, you're going any excess nitrogen will be excreted and and it's going to be available for volatilization so it's very important to tailor the nitrogen in the diet to the animal's needs and to exceed that you run the risk of, of making more nitrogen available for volatilization it really becomes a problem if, if your feed environment uh, includes some high nitrogen rations like distiller's grains, what we found in beef cattle is when they feed distiller's grains, their uh, crude protein content in the diet will go from maybe 13% to 17, 18%. And you can increase your nitrogen, your ammonia emissions by up to 50% when that happens. Very, it's very important that you tailor that in to the animal's needs. Oh, looks like I'm stretching. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to respond to that. I, just by calculation in my head, only 20% of feed nitrogen is going into mill, um, which is really low for uh, systems that are supposed to be really well man managed in terms of feed management. I mean, they can... So, I don't know. So 
really well by the dairies that get up to 30 percent of that feed nitrogen in the milk, and that I would imagine they can now trash the they 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 did they 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 they